And so I am going to pass the baton, so to speak, the microphone here, to our new dean, the new dean of the College of Public Service, Dr. Jonathan Schwartz. Thank you very much. I'm going to do a really brief introduction because I want to really get to the action. But one is there's five seats. If anyone is brave enough to sit in front, please come join us. Uh, and two is I just want to welcome you to the College of Public Service. I know a lot of you are faculty and students, but if you don't know the College of Public Service, uh, we train criminal justice professionals, we train social workers, we train teachers, especially to work in urban settings. Could my faculty please have a seat? No, I'm joking. <laughs> welcome. <laughs> Uh, so, and I think there's really exciting things going on here. So our, in Pacific, a lot of you are probably criminal justice majors or folks on that. It's really an exciting program. We're growing. We have record enrollment this year. Our master's program is on US News and World Report is one of the top master's programs in the country. We have faculty doing amazing research that's cutting edge in the city of downtown Houston. So I think it's an exciting place to be. I think it's what the best criminal justice program you can be at. And look at our alumni if you want, if you have any questions about it. So thank you all for coming. And I'm going to give it over to Constable Rosen, who I had the pleasure of really getting to know this afternoon. So thank you very much and welcome him. How are y'all? How's everybody? Can you hear me OK? I'm pretty loud. I don't know if y'all, do I need a mic or do? Oh, I need a mic. Okay, all right. <laughs> Don't want to break any rules. Uh, I'm Constable Alan Rosen, and I'm the Precinct 1 Constable. I've been elected now. This is my second four-year term. And, uh, so I'm, I'm, and, and I'm a proud U of H downtown alumni. So that's the most important thing. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I manage the second largest constable's office in the United States. And there's certain things that we do that no other constable's office does. And I always like to share with you what that is. So that if any of you CJ majors want to come and work at the constable's office, I want you to know what you're coming to and what different divisions we have. And it's really exciting work. I am extremely passionate about what I do every single day. I never hit that snooze button ever in the morning. Ever. Some of y'all might, but I don't. Uh, thank you so much. And so uh, we do all of the mental health warrants for the whole entire county. So people who are homicidal, suicidal, we pick those people up 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. We have one of the largest mental health units in the United States. So that gives you one facet. People that serve those kinds of warrants are very, very special people because you cannot treat people with mental illness like criminals. You just can't do it. So it takes a very specialized, very highly trained officer to do that. We also do all the juvenile warrants for the whole entire county. So kids that are 10 to 16 years old that are in the juvenile justice system, we're responsible for picking those up countywide as well. On average, and, and Henry is the executive director of it, on average there's about 300 kids locked up in the juvenile detention center. Uh, very sad, but I know that Henry's doing all kinds of great things over there to uh, help get these kids back as productive members of our community. We do all of the environmental investigations for the whole entire county. So we have about 130 undercover cameras up right now as we speak that are looking for people that are illegally dumping. Uh, this, this deals with the quality of life issues in a lot of our neighborhoods in the city and the county. Uh, we, have, we are really subject matter experts on camera technology. So our folks go out and they can pretty much put a camera anywhere. Uh, and, and it really, the, the district attorney's office requires video evidence in order to prosecute those cases as well. We do all the animal cruelty cases for the whole county. So people that mistreat animals. Uh, our officers are embedded at the SPCA and that's all they do is animal cruelty investigations. Uh, we got to be that voice for the animals because obviously animals can't talk. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, so we do that, we have a patrol division, civil division, criminal warrants division. We're highly active in the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force. Um, every uh, quarter we hold a, an initiative and people are out there searching to victimize. Most of the time we're 14, 15, 16 year old girls online, our investigators. And I can tell you, 
we have arrested every spectrum of people coming to meet what they think is a 13, 14, 15 year old girl. Sick. In fact, Thursday I have a press conference. We arrested a surgeon from Galveston, Texas that came here to what he thought to meet was a 15 year old girl. So it's truly sad, all walks of life. Uh, so we have a very active group that does that as well. Um, we are responsible, get this, because I bet a lot of people don't know this, every body that goes to the Institute of Forensic Sciences for a medical examination, we're responsible for that body. The body arrives and we put a GPS tracking system on the body until the body leaves and is released to a, a funeral home. So it's, 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 it, again, it takes a special kind of person to do that kind of work. We also are responsible for the security at all of the downtown courthouse complex. So if you come to any county building downtown, we're responsible for making sure that you get uh, vetted in into the office, into the, into the uh, county buildings, and make sure that y'all are safe and secure while you're there. We're gam game room experts. So we, we raid a game room or a massage parlor every week. So we've seized about $3 million from crooks uh, over the last four or five years. And uh, we really, they're preying on poor people, y'all. People are on fixed incomes and they're going into these establishments thinking they're going to win money. And these machines are so rigged against them that you're going to lose. They're worse than Vegas odds, worse than Louisiana odds. And they're also a hub for crime. So we uh, deal with that quite extensively as well. That's, uh, HPD usually goes out and tickets and then we come back in and raid. So we're doing that every week. Uh, so that kind of gives you an overview. I love U University of Houston downtown. It was a wonderful education for me. It served every component of my need. Uh, I was working full time, I was going to school, and I really wanted to be a policeman. And this was a wonderful place for me to get that type of education. I had great instructors one of which is here with us now. Uh, I had great teachers. I had, it, this institution offered me the kind of diversity that I like to be around. I want to be in a diverse student body. I want to learn what I don't know. And learning from other uh, races, sexual orientation, whatever the case may be, I want to get exposed to all of it. Because it makes me a, a more well-rounded person and understanding other people's lifestyles and other people's struggles. That's what made me who I am today. And I am a very compassionate law enforcement guy. I'm really more of a social service organization than I am a law enforcement agency because when a cold front hits, I'm, we're the first to go out and open up a homeless shelter or a warming center for our homeless population. Or people that we encounter that are mentally ill. I want to help fix society. And everybody in this room obviously shares that dream or that desire because you wouldn't be at this school otherwise. You all, I think y'all are all criminal justice majors, am I right? Yes, yes, yes. okay. All right. Occasionally. County, accounting? Yeah. Good, thank you for being here. Got to get that degree first, they require it. So I don't want to take up, because I know I have other panelists and I've, I've kind of spoken a lot, but you have invested in your future. Um, I require in my department that you have a minimum of 35 hours to come work in our department. I can tell you that there are many agencies out there from the federal government and to local law enforcement that require a bachelor's degree. Pursue it. Don't let it go. And I can tell you from the affordability aspect, from the quality of education, uh, th there was no better place for me. And I wanted to be a criminal defense lawyer, and I thought what better way to learn the system than to work in law enforcement first and then go to law school. So. It was a great education, and I'm going to now sit down <laughs> and let somebody else talk. Uh, unless I met several police officers and people who are, who are for like law enforcement, 
Uh, when I don't have some criminal justice, so I don't have mention, well, don't say criminal justice, go for accounting, go for psychology or something else. Mm -hmm. So my question is, what advantage as a uh, criminal justice student do I have if you work in the department over somebody who's writing psychology or I don't know, really like accounting or something Somebody that is pursuing or is, is going to get a degree in criminal justice tells me that their passion, their desire, their want is to be in the criminal justice field. Because that's why you got the degree. And you know, you can change your degrees a lot. When you're a freshman or sophomore, you can say, you know what, I've, I like criminal justice, but accounting is more my thing. What you're telling an administrator like me is that criminal justice is where you want to be. It's what you're passionate about. It's what your, your profession, that's what you went to school for. So I'm always, this is me, always going to look at that criminal justice applicant first. Because you're telling me I want to be a part of your organization from the criminal justice standpoint. Great question. Thank you. Anyone else have a question? Yes, ma'am. Nice and loud so we all can hear. Did you actually go to law school? I did. I did at South Texas. I had a law firm to take over, uh, a great law firm, actually, a very successful law firm. I hated it. I hated it. And here was my biggest problem, guys. The way I'm built is if I didn't believe you when you were talking to me about your case, it would be very hard for me to, to represent you. I'm, I like honesty. I like integrity. And uh, it was a personal injury trial firm. I hated it. I hated it every day. I hated it. But it's a good education. So I don't want to discourage anybody from going to law school. Please apply. It's great. And you, you think much differently when you, when, you, when you get out of law school than when you came in. So I think that speaks to the experiences we all have, right? Some people are good at one thing and some people don't feel they are, but they fill other shoes and they fill them well. Very true. Yes, Ms. Davis. This is my community outreach director, Erica Davis. We need more hands in the air, please. I mean, what are y'all being a little timid over here? Let, let me tell you. And I can tell you this first and foremost, the vast majority of what I do is build bridges with the community. And the reason I do it, because we're not perfect. And when that mistake comes along, the public deserves to know where I stand and who I am as an agency head. So I spend a tremendous amount of time working with our youth. I have a a youth leadership summit every year where we have a thousand kids that come in and talk about their relationship with law enforcement and we it's raw and if we change one kid's mind about us we've won so I do that every single year every year we have a basketball tournament you're the kid thank you who said that yeah well I want to give him one of my badges over here kind of a, let me give him that. There you go. There you go, my man. I was waiting for that was a cue. <laughs> See, I said that, I paid him about ten bucks to do that. But uh, thank you. I don't even know your name. I should have asked your name. That's so rude of me. Uh, but thank you, young man, for saying that. So that's what we do, guys, at Precinct One, is we build those bridges. We make sure that we bond with the community and make sure that we do everything we can uh, to be a positive influence. Because so often, law enforcement's called at somebody's worst day. It's the worst time in their lives. We see people at their worst. And, you know, they need to see us in a positive light. You know, I always say on the news, if it bleeds, it leads. We need to have some stories that talk about the positive things that law enforcement do because there's so many of them. And so our basketball tournament school giveaway, 1,000 kids, and we have law enforcement officers playing against kids on a basketball court all day. And it's these kind of things 
that hopefully, if something does go wrong, they'll know where the agency stands. And Precinct 1 Constable's Office mirrors the community that we serve from all the way up the ranks, all the way down the ranks. It's diverse, and it looks like the community that we serve. So that's what was most important to me when I took office. So I've spoken way longer than I should have. I have a passion for uh, psychology, substance abuse. Mm -hmm. And when you said about, when you spoke about the mental health warrant, mm -hmm. I've been really struck an interest of mine. So mm -hmm. if you don't mind before you leave, if mm -hmm. you can kind of give me some information because I'm currently a substance abuse counselor, mm -hmm. but my, I'm going for my master's for psychology. Congratulations. I want to get involved in all that. Good. So if you could please give me some yeah. information. Sure. We do one more thing. I hate to take up any more time. God, uh. Uh, you know, what we do a little differently. Let me give you a, a, a for instance of what kind of agency we are. So we do stings at hotels where we actually have women of the night come in and, and we've got a room all wired up and we do these stings to get people out of the life of prostitution. And rather than just take those people that we arrest to jail. We have a team that interviews each person that we take into custody to ensure that they're not a victim. So this team has been trained. Uh, one of the girls that's my human trafficking director was a prostitute for 20 years and a crack addict for 20 years. And she is a nationally known recovery expert now who teaches at the penitentiary every week. We have a class at my office every Wednesday where about 100 girls and a few guys show up and she's coaching them back to the living. And so every sting that we do, there is a component of psychology. There's a component to try to ensure that we're not putting somebody in jail that's a human trafficking victim uh, because they deserve that. They deserve to be evaluated. Uh, I just don't know many people that do that, 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 that they're in a human trafficking component to it. But guys and girls in this room, I can tell you, it's a really big problem in our city. I'm focusing on the pimps in a big way but I'm seeing more and more juveniles cry out. I'm seeing more and more victims that normally wouldn't come forward and talk about this are coming forward and talking about it. And so if you're passionate about children, if you care deeply about them, that is an area of law enforcement that you are really, uh, it's really ripe for somebody with great ideas to come in and be passionate about that because uh, and it's, sometimes it's hard, I can tell you. It's very hard to see some of these kids because we want to help them, but they're so in control by their, by their pimps and things like that that we do our part to keep them away, and they run back. So, and I know, Henry, we've had a lot of cases from juvenile detention. Uh, so I've spoken way more than I should have. So who's up next? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So you're going to see Constable Rosen leave in a few minutes because he has another engagement. Um, but Constable Rosen, thank you so much for taking your time out. I really appreciate that. I want to point something out. So this is the College of Public Service. We have criminal justice, social work, and urban education. And everything of the three degrees that we have here was what Constable Rosen talked about. Because it's not just, and when you're in criminal justice, you're not just, you're, you're not just working in that field alone. You're working, you need social work skills. You, you need the skills to be able to go in and maneuver among people and know how to do that. He talked about one of his people doing, being an educator. Elias here is, uh, also does a lot of teaching in his job as well. So when you're here, you're getting aspects of all of those degrees. Those are, those, that's what we are here is an interdisciplinary college. We like to bring in people whose work is interdisciplinary. So with that, I am going to uh, pass the baton here to uh, Mr. Rivera. Uh, Elias Rivera is a crime scene investigator, and I will let Elias tell you about his life pre-UHD, at UHD, post-UHD. Thank you. Good evening. 
So um, this is a special year for me, 2019, because it marks a, a 20 year mark for me. I was telling Stephen outside, I thought about using Prince, the artist Prince as an, as an, an opener, but I didn't know how many of y'all would, and I said y'all, I'm from Texas, I said y'all. I don't know how many of y'all would appreciate Prince, because uh, he had a song out called 1999. How many of y'all remember that? So, so some of y'all may not know this, the younger ones, but at, there was a time when people thought that when the year 2000 struck, there was gonna be an economic and a digital collapse. And so Y2K, and so Prince wrote a song, said, uh, you know, they say 2000, zero, zero, party over, oops, out of time. So tonight I'm gonna party like it's 1999. So obviously the world didn't end, uh, but my, Grown-up world began uh, in 1999, so I'll go ahead and start with that. So thank y'all for those of y'all who are over 35 or something, I don't know, and who, who can appreciate Prince, who's an incredible artist who we lost a couple of years ago. But anyway, uh, my academic and my professional career began in 1999. Um, I graduated from a school in the southeast side of town called Milby High School. I don't know if we have any, buff, any Milby buffs in here. So I graduated from a high school called Milby, Milby High School. I was 18 years old, and I knew ever since I was a little boy I wanted to be a police officer. So I started calling all these agencies, HPD, Pasadena, uh, Sheriff's Office, DPS, and I said, I'm 18 years old, I wanna be a cop, will you hire me? The only one that responded was the Sheriff's Office and they said, look, you're too young, but at 18 years old, you can be a file clerk with us, can you type? So what do you tell someone who asks you a question when you're trying to get a job from them, what do you say? Yes, yes of course I can type, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, so I, I, I drive down to 601 Lockwood and I, and, I, and I apply to be a file clerk with the Harris County Sheriff's Office in, in uh, October of 99. Thankfully, I ended up getting hired on. I don't know what I typed. The minimum was like 40 words a minute. I think I typed 44 words a minute or something like that, whatever it was. So I hire on as a file clerk and I end up working at an old jail just down the street called 1301 Franklin. It's now, it, it's now been condemned and all kinds of stuff. But uh, I worked at 1301 Franklin for a couple of years as a file clerk. Uh, I walked in the building, saw all these deputies wearing these, some of y'all probably don't remember, but back in the day we used to wear these tan pants, we used to wear the cowboy hats, the boots, it was just, it was, it was awesome. And I said, I can't wait. So I did my two years as a file clerk, back then you had to be 20 to be what is called a detention officer or a jailer. So once I turned 20, I, I transitioned, I applied for and transitioned to become a jailer. Uh, I then, when I turned 21, uh, applied for and, and, and went to our academy. I went to the Harris County Sheriff's Office Academy on Atascacita, went through this seven month academy. My academy started with 61 students. We graduated 33. It was, it was an incredible, incredible academy. It was challenging, it was awesome, it was a great experience. So I ended up coming back to the jail right across the street, 701 North San Jacinto. Some of y'all may be familiar with that, just seeing that it's right there. And um, so I worked the jail for a couple years. I, try to go out to the streets. I eventually go to the east side Wallaceville uh, substation, 14350 Wallaceville. We cover the east side of Harris County. Pretty busy area. I was out there for a few years. I eventually interviewed for and was an awarded a position at our academy to be a what we call a red shirt, a, an instructor, maybe a drill sergeant for those of y'all, maybe military. Um, so I did that for a couple of years, had a great time, and in 2012, um, I transferred, I, I interviewed for and, uh, and transferred to the crime scene unit uh, to be a CSI, and that's what I've been doing for about the last eight years, and it's been, a, it's been an awesome ride, and I'll talk to you about that in just a second. At the same time when all that was going on in 1999, I also started my career here at UHD, my academic career here. So I come from a large family from the southeast side of town, and there had only been one person before me who went to college, my Uncle Jesse, and he loved UHD. He got a, a degree in computer science. He's now doing very well working for Chevron, and so he just spoke very highly about this college, and so I said, okay, well, let me see what they got. Uh, I end up doing some research, and I see that UHD has a criminal justice program, that there's practi practitioners from the field in, that are teaching in this program, uh, and so I'm like, well, this is awesome. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't even thinking about the convenience of literally going to work down the street from my job. That was just an added blessing. That was incredible. And so I, I start my career here at UHD in 99. It took me six years to get a bachelor's degree because I was working full time at those jails across the bayou. It took me six years to get a four year degree. I did it, I loved it. I graduated in 2005 and I said, yeah, I'm done. Even though I knew back then the 100 Club was not only paying, I don't know what the status is with the 100 Club right now. They were an incredible to me. I am forever indebted to them. Back then they would pay for your, your bachelor's degree and if you maintained a certain GPA, you could also come back for your master's and they would flip that bill as well as a police officer and, and whatnot. 
So all my friends were saying, now, well, you're going to come back to graduate school? I said, I'm done. I'm done. Y'all can have it. I'm out. I graduated in 2005, and I left. And then how many of you here are, are, are lifelong learners? Raise your hand if you're a lifelong. Those of you who didn't raise your, your hand, maybe you've never heard that term. I would encourage you to look that up. Being a lifelong learner means that the way I, I tell my wife this, the wheels in my head are always turning. The wheels in my head are, you ever, you ever try to learn about something, even though you know it's not going to affect you? You, you? you may not use it in your profession, but you just want to learn about it. Whatever it is, medicine, vehicles, automobile, whatever it may be, politics, whatever. That's me, and that's many of you here, and that's a wonderful thing. And those wheels were turning, and I knew I needed to go back. So I started the process, and three years later, in 2008, I came back. It took me three years to get my master's degree because I was working full-time again. Uh, three years to get a two-year degree. I ended up graduating in 2011. I had a fantastic time here, knowing that my instructors here were uh, academic professionals, that, that some of them were re retired federal agents. Uh, some of them, uh, we, I had, a, I remember Sam Nucci, former Houston Police Department uh, police chief, was one of my instructors. It, it was just an incredible time. Uh, it, was, it was invaluable, the experience that I got from people who actually had been there, done that, and were now uh, seasoned and, and, and researched and well-known, and so it was awesome. It was a great experience, and again, graduated in 2011 with a graduate degree, which brings me to where I'm at now. Do you need a, a degree uh, to be in law enforcement? No, you don't. So why do it? Because here's a, I, I've been blessed with a lot of nuggets of good wisdom over the years, and I'm going to share some of that with you. And if anything I say sounds intelligent, it's because I heard it from someone else. Just full disclosure. <laughs> full disclosure. Your job, remember this, your job is to make yourself the most marketable candidate out there. Everybody with me on that? That is your job. As smart as you are and as awesome as your resume is, guess what? There's a lot of people out there that got one just as good, and if not better. It is your job, you are your greatest asset. It is your job to make yourself the most marketable candidate out there. Whatever classes you could take online, in person, certifications you could get, um, reading good books, reading good nonfiction books that'll feed you, and the stuff that you could share with others in the field and, and, and those around you, uh, that is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful thing and that's why I did it. In law enforcement, there's a decent amount of people with a bachelor's degree, certainly not a lot, but there's even less with a master's. There's even less with a doctorate. So it's your job, it's your goal to make yourself as marketable as you can. There's a lot of competition out there and as we all know, life is hard, right? So those are the things that brought me to UHD, what I'm doing now. What did a, a master's degree from UHD do for me personally? Number one, it gave me confidence. It gave me confidence. Knowing that I could negotiate a feat, like getting a graduate degree, gave me confidence of knowing that when, when, when I, as a CSI, when I'm working a murder where a child has been killed, a family has been murdered, a police officer has been murdered, and I'm one of the assigned investigators on that case, it gave me the confidence to know, you know what, I'm capable of committing myself to this long-term goal because I've, been, I've done it before. And that's a wonderful thing. And as, as many of you here know, life is hard. Life is hard. And the only way you're gonna be able to negotiate these challenges in life is to have confidence. Right? That was one thing it did. Number, another thing it taught me to do is it taught me how to write. I'll never forget when I showed up uh, in graduate school, I went, in, I went to the main building, bought a bunch of Scantrons. That way I could be ready for my test in, in, in grad school. Well, then I found out in grad school, you don't use Scantrons. You got to buy these little books. You got to buy these little blue books. Are y'all still using those little blue books? You got to go buy these books. And I'm like, well, no, nah, I mean, with, with Scantrons. And no, we don't use that. It's all writing. It's all writing. Y'all may have heard the phrase, the, the pen is mightier than the sword. Let me tell you, friends, in law enforcement, especially in today's day and age, the pen is mightier than the sword. You have to document a lot, and you have to document well. There is a massive amount, and rightfully so, there is a massive amount of, of accountability and responsibility placed on law enforcement professionals. The public expects us to do our job, do it well, and document it. We have a saying in law enforcement, if, if, it ain't, if, if we didn't write it down, if it ain't kind of like that saying, if it ain't writ, it ain't law. If we didn't write it down, it didn't happen. So you have to learn how to write. Now, is this only for a death investigator like me? No. Guess who else does this? The patrol deputies. The patrol men and women who are out here, HPD, UHD, sheriff's office, constables, all these men and women that are in the uniform riding bikes and horses and patrol cars, they have to document a ton of stuff. You have to have strong writing skills. 
You have to have strong writing skills. I would submit to you, if you're a weak writer, you're, you're not going to make it in law enforcement. You have to know how to write, right? Um, another thing that, that getting a graduate degree here from UHD helped me do is it taught me how to question and do my own research. We live in a day and age, and y'all know this, and certainly social media, I'm, I'm sure, is a, plays a little role in this, but we live in a day and age where everybody is willing to give their opinion about everything. And oftentimes, people just take it as face value. Oh, did you hear that now they're doing this? Is that true? Maybe, maybe not. In law enforcement, we, we have, I don't know how many law enforcement professionals we have in here, but in law enforcement, we, we have the, 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 the policy guy. You got the, well, you know it's policy. You're supposed to do this and that. Is it really, or is he just saying that? Coming to UHD taught me how to question things and to research and find credible sources, not Wikipedia, <laughs> find credible sources and back up my argument. Because in life, you have to do that. In law enforcement, we have to do that. As a death investigator, I have to do that. I have to question things. I have to do my research. I have to back it up with credible sources. So these are just a few of the things that UHD has done for me. Uh, it has been an amazing ride in law enforcement. I can't believe looking back. I'm only 38. At 18, I started my professional career, my academic career. But it's this October, October 4th, I made 20 years with the sheriff's office. Uh, it has been an amazing ride. I've had, I've had some incredibly highs, uh, high time, good times, and I almost said high times. Let me, say, let me not say that. <laughs> I don't want to say that. I've had some highs, and I've had some lows, and, and that's how life is. Uh, you got to be confident. You, you got to know what you're doing. You got to be proficient. You got to study. Uh, and it's, been a, it's been an amazing, uh, amazing ride. Uh, I'll end with this. Most of what my job is has nothing to do with what you see on TV. Um, I don't drive a Hummer or a Corvette. I don't dress like this every day. Um, I drive a pickup truck. We have pickup truck, trucks and SUVs. Uh, because unfortunately, as a CSI, I have to drive to very remote areas. Bayous, woods, ditches. Why? Because people hide bodies there. Uh, I have to jump into dumpsters sometimes. That's a lot of fun. I have to climb underneath mobile homes. I have to search massive fields looking for bones, for blood spatter. Um, that is the, the reality of my job. I still love it. I work with an amazing group of men and women. Uh, we work together. We're a family. Uh, I'm more than happy to answer any questions you may have on it, but uh, it's, it's probably substantially different than what you're used to seeing on TV, which most things are. Uh, but it, it, it's been a great ride thus far, and I guess I will end with that. Elias, tell us, give us a... a a day in the life. What's a typical day for you? So, good question. Uh, so I work down the street at 810 North San Jacinto, uh, right on the other side of this jail. And I, I work in an office downtown. Why? Because I am countywide. I'm a CSI and I, I could be in Beaumont. I could be in, I could be in Katy. I could be in Spring. I could be in Clear Lake. Uh, and so we work downtown. I show up and we wait for a scene to drop. Uh, we usually get a, we get a phone call that there's a, a death in wherever, you know, in, in the east side of Harris County, north side, wherever it may be. Um, I pack my things. I go out there either by myself with, with, with a couple of other investigators. Uh, we go out there and we, we work the scene. Uh, it's Texas, so it's hot sometimes. Uh, you, you, you work in the heat, you know, you're out there working these scenes in 100 degree weather. Um, you drive far distances, obviously, because it's a massive county. It's one of the largest, it's, I believe it's the third largest county in the nation. Um, do we get scenes every day? Am I out there working murders every day? Absolutely not. Uh, I may be on the field one day a week. I could be out there in the field once every two weeks. I may be out in the field four days in one week. It, it just depends on how busy we are. So my job is everything but consistent. It's very inconsistent. And that's one thing that that, that drives law enforcement professionals is they like that inconsistency. They, they like that. Uh, but oftentimes, me personally, I'm either at my desk typing a report, I'm in the laboratory processing evidence, analyzing uh, items for blood, semen, saliva, whatever I'm looking for, hair fibers, uh, photographing evidence, or conducting a, an investigation out there in the field. So, Any other questions, or any questions rather for Mr. Rivera? Yes, yes, yes ma'am. It, it wasn't criminal justice, yes ma'am. I apologize if I, didn't, if I didn't say that earlier, but yes. Yes, so um, 
you, uh, again, as I mentioned, you don't, you, didn't, you don't have to have that degree. What it did for me was it got me to investigations a lot earlier. I was 30 years old when I went to investigations where without a master's degree, I likely would have been older, 10 years older, 12 years older, 14 years. I would have gotten there eventually, but it would take me a lot longer. So having that graduate degree, as a matter of fact, uh, when I interviewed, I interviewed with 30 other candidates. Um, of the 30 of us that interviewed, I placed second. Uh, the gentleman before me was in the Air Force, and he had two master's degrees. He was number one, and I was number two. Uh, again, that doesn't say anything about the, the men and women that were behind me. They're awesome. They're bright, and they're, you know, but, but, but having the master's degree helped a lot, but it wasn't CJ. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Mr. Maples. Um, I was, I don't want to... You know, uh, that's a great question. Um, Warren, I'm going to I'm going to quote Warren Buffett on this. Uh, Warren Buffett said, uh, find a job doing something you like and never work a day in your life. Uh, I thought that was incredible advice. Find a job doing something you like and never work a day in your life. Uh, whatever you're passionate about, um, I remember being, I remember vividly being a child and, and growing up where I grew up, it was HPD and I would see the Houston Police Department drive around uh, and, and I, I was passionate about seeing police officers. I, I was passionate about seeing them fight crime and, and arrest the bad guys and help people. So uh, find out what you're passionate about, what you enjoy doing. Uh, as a caveat for law enforcement, uh, one thing that I'll hear every now and then is I'll hear someone say, ah, you know, I may, I may give it a shot. I may just try to be a cop for a little bit. That's a bad, and Elias, this is just Elias. That's a bad idea. That's a, it's just, I couldn't fathom doing this job unless I knew that I knew that I knew this is what I wanted to do. It's a dangerous job. It's an emotionally stressful job. Uh, and so... You, you, it, it should be something that you know that you want to do. And in my view, no matter what you do in life, should be something, whatever degree plan you choose, it should be something that you're passionate about, something that you want to do. And I, I guess I hope that gives any direction. Tell me about what, what the, a difficult day on the job. What, what's, what's the stress? Um, an officer down, that's by far the, one of the most difficult days, which we had one recently. Uh, that's, it's very difficult to watch that. Uh, children and babies are always, that, that, those are always hard to watch. They're always hard to, to work, to process. And so uh, it, it, it takes a toll on you. And I, I think that no matter what line of work you're in, you should always have some sort of outlet. And that's one thing that I always advise younger officers of, is make sure that you have an outlet. And whatever you do, don't hang out with other police officers when you're off. Because all you do is talk about work, you know. But whatever that outlet is, whether it's church, jogging, fishing, reading, traveling, make sure you have that outlet to, to handle the stress that comes with it. Any other questions? Good question. No, uh, you, you do not. Well... It, it used, to, it, I believe it's two years. You have to be certified two years to be a, a, a CSI. I'm going to be frank, though. I, I would never see anyone. I, it'd be very rare to see someone with only two years experience walk in the door and be able to go straight there. Uh, you, you're going to have to do some time. So I do hear this a lot. I, I do hear this from college students. You know, well, you know, I'm going to SAM and I'm getting my degree in, you know, criminal justice or criminal, criminology. And I, I want to be a CSI. And that's wonderful. There's nothing wrong with that. But uh, understand that you're likely not going to be able to just walk in the door doing that. Uh, every agency is different. Uh, but as many of us here know, sometimes you got to kind of start from the bottom and, and work your way up. Uh, so it requires a little bit of time. I, I believe our policy currently is, is two years as a peace officer before you can transfer to the crime scene unit. But I, I could be wrong. But it's, it's either two years or zero. You just have to be a certified peace officer. Uh, but it's rare for us to see anyone come to the crime scene unit with less than five. It, that's very rare. Yes, ma'am. Is there a social comment, but uh, I wanted to know if like, your um, job um, impacted in your personal life, and you're like, well, you to like, Yeah. And then you go home, and then you're just thinking about it, and it affects, like, your attention that you put to your family. Yeah. So, uh, 
I, I always tell people that I became a worse investigator when I had kids. Uh, when, whenever you don't have kids, it's really hard for you to, to relate and empathize with others. And, and I'm, I'm being facetious when I say that. I mean, obviously, uh, I, I think having, me having a family made me a more, certainly a more compassionate person. Uh, and so w whenever you, you know, you, sometimes cops get a, a bad rash, you know, oh, they're, you know, like this cop was rude, you know. Oftentimes I see it's, it's younger officers. They just, you know, they're not experienced or whatever the case may be. Uh, but when you have a family, you certainly become more compassionate. And so uh, it can take a heavy toll on you. That's why I said earlier, you have to make sure that you have an outlet. You have to take care of yourself, every aspect, you know, your, your physical well-being, your psychological well-being. Uh, you, you, what you don't want to do is, is, is keep telling yourself, it's fine, you're, 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 you're good, don't worry about it. Uh, your, your mind has a way of talking. You know what I'm talking about, guys? Your mind will talk to you and tell you, like, you need to slow down. You need to chill out. You need to take some time off. Your mind will talk to you, and, and you, you got to listen to your body and, and take care of yourself. Uh, it, when I was on the streets, we used to say, you know, you, you're no good helping someone else if you can't get to them safely, right? I'm no good driving 100 miles an hour if, it, to another officer if I can't get to him. So same thing, I'm, I'm no good helping my coworkers or the public if I can't take care of myself, and I'm not good. So you have to watch out for yourself. Um, I just have um, maybe something you could talk about. You mentioned that you started at Harris County, and I'm, I'm not trying to yell at you to make sure it wasn't here. Okay. Um, and um, and you, you've been there your whole career. Right. So can you speak to what you may potentially see as an advantage to kind of choosing your agency and then have sticking with them versus you know people who aren't quite sure and sure. hop around different agencies? Yeah. What advantages that may present to you as a yeah, yeah, so f great question. So first of all, and, and this should be common sense, but I mean, no agency is perfect. Uh, there are undoubtedly people who would badmouth the sheriff's office, who would badmouth HPD, Precinct 1. Uh, no agency is perfect. Uh, every agency has its high points, its flaws. They're all imperfect organizations. Um, but I, for me personally, it, it's been one of the best decisions I've ever made to stick with the same agency. And, I, I, and knowing that I was going to be with an agency that had a lot of opportunity that, that that's a big complaint you'll hear from police officers maybe that sometimes work with a small agency oh well there's there was nowhere for me to to grow and move so i guess uh, w when you decide you want to hire on with an agency uh constable uh, allen was just given the just a a, a a list of so many different areas th that they cover and that's wonderful that gives you a, an idea of just all the things that you could do there with his agency. So I get, it gives you history with the agency. It gives you tenure. I think also it shows the management and the leadership of the organization that you're there and you're there for the long run. You're, you're, you're dedicated, you're committed. You're not gonna jump, you know, jump ship at the first opportunity outside. Uh, obviously, sometimes you reach, you reach a point where if, uh, I've seen this where someone will be in, start in local law enforcement and then go fed. Someone mentioned the FBI earlier. Uh, that's pretty common, starting out in local law enforcement and then going to the federal going feds, uh, because it's so competitive to get to that level. So I don't see anything wrong with that, me personally. But yeah, you definitely don't want to be 25 years old having worked for like three different police agencies, because that's going to raise a lot of red flags. Yes, ma'am. Any other questions for Mr. Rivera? Awesome. Thank you. And Last but certainly not least is our own Mr. Gonzalez here, who is the uh, adjunct. His is an adjunct professor uh, here uh, at the College of Public Service, as well as his position as the executive director of juvenile probation. So take it away. Thank you. Thank you. All right. As the very very senior person on this panel, when I look at these dates here of our graduation. Wow, that was a long time ago. I attended the University of Houston Downtown College, is what it was called when I was here, when the only buildings, it was just that main building there that had two sides to it, it was north and south. And I'll never forget one semester, my struggle was math. And so, you know, algebra was one of those things that I took probably every year that I was at UHDC back then. And so I finally got to the point to where I was passing it. And, and I, was just, I, I was just so happy because I, I was finally doing it. And it's, it's the day of the final, and the professor says, 
Mr. Gonzalez, I don't see your name on here. Your name's not on the roster anywhere. But how? I've been here every day or every class. And uh, he just couldn't figure it out. And, and I was trying to show proof that, yes, I'm supposed to be here. So then I look at my schedule. And it was, let's say, room five, uh, 435S is what was on my paper. I was in North. Same room, but in the North campus just happened to be an algebra class as well. Um, I did some serious begging of the professor who I should have been in, who then let me stay in this other class and take the final. Uh, it was like, yes, finally. Um, yeah, so that's all that was there. This building, actually, does anyone know what this building was before we have this new beautiful building? I, I know you know. This actually used to be the dorms for UHDC. There was an old hotel, and students used to live here. There was a bar in the basement. I remember that very well. <laughs> um, because back then, you could drink at 18 years old. So there was a bar on campus. Um, yeah, and so, so there were dorms here at UHDC. Um, do you remember the name of the hotel, anybody? I forget what it was. Yeah, so I, I go way back then. My life before UH, uh, UHD, I, was, uh, I graduated from Madison High School here in Houston. When I was at Madison, they had the criminal justice program there, so it was a magnet school for criminal justice. However, I, it was the first year that I had taken classes there because someone said, take it, it's easy, it's a fun class. I took it, wasn't that easy, but it was fun. And then I think it was my junior year, they were leaving that school to open their own campus, the High School for Law Enforcement and Criminal Justice. And I decided I was not going to leave and, and follow to the new school because then I'd have all my friends that I'd leave behind. So I stayed there. So when I graduated, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I knew what I did not want to do, and that was to work in the family business. Uh, my dad is in sheet metal fabrication, and I just didn't want to do that. Um, because it meant working in a very hot environment. Um, I wasn't about that. And really, I think it was just the, the idea of working in the family business wasn't exactly what I wanted to do. So I figured I'd go to college until I determined what it is I wanted to do, until I found myself. I don't know that when I went to school, when I started, that I really imagined that I was going to finish. Because then when we go back to high school, I was a vocational ed student which means no one talked to you about going to college because what you did and that when you were on that track is you went to school half a day and you worked half a day and got credit for it. It was wonderful. It was the best thing. So when I came to, to UHD, I wasn't exactly prepared for college. Um, so I too took six years to graduate. We'll say it's because I was working full time. Um, <laughs> that's my story. Um, but it, it, it was a struggle. Um, it was when I was 19 years old, I was sitting in a seminar uh, that a professor was given, and they were talking about volunteer opportunities and internships. So I decided, OK, let me go volunteer. This sounds like this would be interesting. Maybe I'll find myself that way. So I volunteered with adult probation with pretrial services. Pretrial services back then was a part of adult probation, and it's not that any, it's, it's a separate entity now. Um, so I did that, and with pretrial services, what you did is you interviewed defendants in both county and city jails, and uh, you did their application for a personal recognizance bond. So I spent my time, it was, a, it was an internship again, or a volunteer, I was volunteering, in the jails interviewing people that had been arrested, and then someone else would go and present their application to the judge to see how they'll get out on a PR bond. It was pretty cool. Uh, when I first started, I was calling defendants and reminding them to go to court, or calling those that didn't go to court. One of the bad experiences there is I was doing that, and, and I'm, I'm asking, let's say, for Joe Smith, and then the lady who's sitting in front of me turned around quickly and starts waving, and, and I'm insisting to talk to Joe, and that's when she tells me he's deceased. Okay, well, we should have done something with that card. It's not a pleasant experience to, to do that. So it, it, I was having fun there. And uh, then within a few weeks, they had offered me actually a paid part-time position. So again, 19 years old, did that, uh, accepted the position, uh, worked with pretrial 
still going to school here. I was working midnights, and uh, then I would get out and go to school. And then I met someone there who was working part-time with pre-trial, but worked full-time for juvenile probation. And he was telling me about what he does, and I said, that might be fun, let me look at something there. So he hooked me up with being a, a volunteer, which was back then a juvenile court volunteer, working with kids or mentoring kids in the detention center. I did that and I really enjoyed that. I thought that was a lot of fun. So then I had to figure out how do I get over there now because juvenile probation seems to be where I'd, I'd like to give that a try again until I discover myself and find out what I really want to do. So I did that. I volunteered there and um, then a position came open. I'm still in school because remember it took me a little longer. Um, and there's, there were positions that did not require degrees. Uh, it was a diversion officer position. I did that, and I, I got that. I had just turned 21 years old. So I've been working for Harris County since I was 19 years old, and that, again, is a long, 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 long time ago. Um, and uh, I've been there. That was long. Uh, um, and, and I've been there ever since. Um, I, I really enjoy what I'm doing. I, I enjoyed every part of it. When I first got there, I was a diversion officer, still working midnights at intake. Best thing ever, because then you could do your homework at night. Now remember, I'm still trying to decide what I'm gonna do with myself, because uh, I'm not sure what I'm gonna do. But I really did like uh, working with juvenile probation. But to move up, you had to have a degree. And remember when I said I just was going to school to decide what I wanted to do, so I really didn't take it that serious. Um, but now that I discovered I wanted to be a juvenile probation officer and it required a degree, it meant that I had to really shift the way I was doing things as far as school goes. So I decided to hunker down and let's really focus on school because I want to graduate, which I eventually did. Again, it was great working midnights and getting paid to do your homework because what I was paid to do was to take kids um, from law enforcement who were arrested and then you process them into the detention center, you release them. Um, but you didn't get that many customers in the middle of the night, so it, it was great. Uh, graduated and then became a probation officer, was a field probation officer covering the Houston 5th Ward, 2nd Ward in Denver Harbor area. Loved it out there. Um, had a, a lot of fun as being a probation officer out there. I was a resource training officer for probation officers, a gang liaison. I uh, got really involved in the community, uh, working with service providers out there. Uh, was asked to be a part of a school board of George I. Sanchez Charter School, the first charter school, one of the first charter schools in Houston, became a, a member of that board. Um, and again, just had a, a, a lot of fun with that. Um, moved on to be, get my first supervisor job uh, in a new division or a new part of our department, which was a unit that was supervising kids were, who were being released from our residential facilities or from being locked up. Um, did that for a while and then one of the chiefs approached me about considering something different. Um, and, and when I talk about our department, I'll tell you about how, how cool it is and that you have all these different things that you can do. So when I hear people talk about, uh, you know, being interested in psychology uh, or even accounting, there's, we can use all of that in our department. I'll get to that in a bit. Um, he approached me and asked if I would consider doing something, again, very, very different from what we've done or what I've done. And that was to move, move over to an education division. With our department, we're unique in that we actually operate a charter school. So in addition to being the chief juvenile probation officer, I'm also the superintendent of the Excel Academy Charter School. Um, so what he wanted me to do was to be the uh, assistant deputy director for education. That wasn't my background. I wasn't an educator. But he thought because of my involvement with the school district and then I was a school-based pro uh, probation officer and just my involvement with school, Oh yeah, another thing I did when I was in my 20s, before I was married and no kids, I became the PTO president of Wheatley High School. Yeah, and how did that happen? Unfortunately, there was very little parental involvement with, uh, there at Wheatley, 
but as a probation officer who covered that area, I was in there almost a couple of days a week, really as a surrogate parent for the kids that were there. Because uh, as probation officers, that's kind of the role that we step into. Um, yeah, so because of all that experience, he thought it would be good if I moved over into that division because what he wanted was to kind of marry our, our school with the probation department because they were kind of really two separate departments. So I did that, eventually become in the deputy director over education, um, then became the assistant executive director, assistant chief juvenile probation officer. And September 1st of this year made my one year mark um, as the chief juvenile probation officer. Uh, th thank you. So that has put me with our department for 34 years. Um, and again, the, the really cool thing is that I, I feel like I've not been in the same place or doing the same job for that many years. Because again, when you look at where I started, it was as a diversion officer at intake, you know, taking the kids in. Then it became a field officer working in the community and really becoming a part of that community which is what I really loved, and, and that was a lot of fun. Um, then in getting into management, I, I was fortunate that when I got into that new unit, there was a lot of new things going on, so it gave me the opportunity to, to implement programs. So we grew from an aftercare unit to more of a specialized unit to where we had a gang unit there. I had the opportunity to travel to several places throughout the country to look at existing gang programs to bring one to Houston and start one up. Um, so we started a gang unit, sex offender unit, drug treatment aftercare program, uh, gender specific programs, um, and, and then a mental health program to where we have, and we actually have someone in the audience who worked for that unit, um, to where we coupled a therapist, a licensed therapist with a probation officer and they actually go into the home to provide very intense and very much needed services to the families. So it gave me the opportunity to implement programs like that. Then going into the education division taught me a whole bunch of stuff about education. Um, and what was really cool with that is when I was placed in that first position in education, uh, uh, the other candidates were people that had doctorate degrees in education, had, were certified teachers, certified principals. And at that point, I had a bachelor's degree in criminal justice. But the chief at that point had enough faith and believed in me enough to, to think that I could do that. But he did put one requirement. I need you to go back to school. Um, and that way, and he, he said it can go, you can go to law school, you can get your, your master's degree, but I need you to really go back again because we're looking at who else really feels they should have been in this position. So what did I do? I went back to the University of Houston downtown 20 years later is when I got my degree. So there's 20 years between uh, when I received my bachelor's degree in 88 and then um, plus 20 <laughs> when I got my master's degree. Um, and, uh, and I'm still here. Now I'm teaching it and really loving doing that. Uh, I believe that when I teach the classes, what I want is to really teach the students how to apply the stuff that, that we're learning. Not as much to memorize names and dates and stuff like that, but how do you apply what you're learning to real life? And I think that's what's great about University of Houston downtown, particularly with criminal justice, because you're right down the street from where everything happens as far as criminal justice goes. I think it gives us the opportunity as a department to be a teaching department because then we can just be kind of an extension of this campus and, and of a student's academics and then help you actually apply what you're learning. Um, it's a great recruitment tool for me and all my students know that I'm here so that I can recruit. If, if anyone's looking for a job, an entry level position, give me a call. Um, Let's see, uh, yeah, so that, that's me and, and, and our department. We are the third largest uh, juvenile probation department in the country, and I think it's really cool to be able to say that uh, some, a, a University of Houston downtown graduate is running the third largest juvenile probation department in the country. I think it's cool to say that our sheriff is a graduate of the University of Houston downtown. Uh, I think it's great that the whole panel today was Harris County. I thought that was cool. Uh, I didn't realize that until I saw that. Um, 
Yeah, like I said, we're unique in that not only do we have a charter school campus, um, but we're also fortunate that we have a health services division. So we have psychologists, uh, a psychiatrist, uh, therapists, clinicians on staff to work with our kids, both in our facilities and in the community. We have specialty courts. Our specialty courts are, make sure I can get this right, we have the care court which started out as a girls court. It's a court that focuses on kids who have been involved in human trafficking. We have a mental health court. We have a drug court and we have a gang court. I named them all, didn't I? All right. Um, and, and we have clinicians in those courts and probation officers in there. We have parent partners. We just have a bunch of fun stuff in there. Um, you know, people that are in account uh, that are in accounting, um, we need them. We have our budget department. Um, we have, like I said, the, the schools. So we have the teachers and all the positions that are associated with schools. And again, I think that gives us or gives you students really a, a great place to go work. Check us out. We're always hiring. Um, I could go on and on and on, but now I'm going to open it up to questions. Yes. I'm sorry, are you supposed to point the person? Oh, okay. <laughs> we do. Yes, we do offer, uh, we have volunteers there. What we don't have is a volunteer division anymore. Uh, so what we'll do is if you're interested in volunteering is we refer you to some agencies that we get our volunteers from. We have a wonderful internship program uh, to where we get a lot of students from the University of Houston downtown. Uh, we, and I'm really proud of our program because we also get a lot of students out of state from other states coming in. Uh, again, I really hope that we are a teaching department where people can come in, our interns. I, what I wanna make sure is that they're not just filing papers, that they're not just making phone calls, that they're actually learning uh, about our department, so we do rotate them to, to different areas of the department so you can get a, an overview of the department and where you may be interested in. Um, it is competitive, you do apply and we only take a certain number. And then as far as graduate school, we have an externship program with the university here to where it is actually a paid part-time position. Um, so if, if you're a graduate student out there and you're looking for that, talk to, um, I'm not sure who the point is coordinating that at this point. There you go. Uh, yes. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, give us a call if you're interested in volunteering, and then we will connect you to the right people. Any other questions? That's a really good question, and, and I'm asked that quite a bit, and I'll, I'll even hear from staff who will say, oh, Henry, things are different from when you were there. The names are different of the kids. Everything else is still there. You know, I, I think years ago we were warned that you were gonna get these super predators because of all the mothers that were using crack, and then the crack babies were gonna turn into these horrible super predators. We didn't see that. Um, you know, I, I think the same things that I saw back then as a probation officer, I still see today. Now, what I'm proud of as far as changing is that I, I think we are in the middle of a lot of transformation right now with juvenile probation, particularly here in, in Harris County. Uh, earlier, Constable Rosen mentioned 300 and something kids in, in our detention center. We have about 300 or a little over 300 kids that are in one of our three facilities. We operate the Juvenile Detention Center, which is caddy corner to here, 1200 Congress, where we have a 250 capacity detention center. The detention center is for kids that are penned in court. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and uh, within the last five years, our average has been about 245 kids in that detention center. A little before that, we were at 340 kids. Today, we're at 150 kids in detention, <coughs> which, which I think is really good that we've taken the number down. 
What that means is that we before had kids that perhaps didn't need to be in the detention center uh, being detained. Um, it, you know, years ago, it was easy for a parent to come in and say, I told Johnny that if he ever got arrested, don't call me because I'm not picking him up. Therefore, I'm not going to go get him. Parents can't do that anymore. Um, thank you. Excuse me. Um, so really, the kids that I think are in, de are in our detention center today are those kids who are at a, uh, at a much higher risk level. And, and so it's the more appropriate kid. As far as our other facilities, we, when I took over, we had three post-adjudicated facilities, meaning these are kids who had already been adjudicated, went to court, and the, the disposition in court is that they were being removed from the home and sent to one of our lockup facilities. Um, our numbers were low enough to where I was able to shut down one of our three residential facilities to where now we have only two post-adjudicated facilities, and neither one of them are at full capacity. We also had uh, an excess of 40 kids sent to private placement at any given time. Um, and private placement means that it's been determined that one of our facilities isn't appropriate for the kid, so we're going to send them somewhere else and we're going to pay for that, and that can be out of state. Today we have four kids who are in a private placement, or actually so far this year it's been four kids that have been sent to private placement. <clears throat> you guys have probably seen some of the uh, issues with the state school, the Texas Juvenile Justice Department, um, and their, the, the facilities that they operate. Last year, well, last year we were about 22% of all in new intakes into the state school or the state juvenile prison system. Today we are 11% of the intakes only, which is great. Um, for the past five years, you saw about 11% or really one out of every 10 kids who were in front of one of our juvenile uh, courts was being sent to the state school. Today, we're less than 1%. Um, and the way we're able to do this is to give our judges more options and more alternatives in the community so that if a kid needs services, we can provide those services in the home or in the community, and that kid doesn't have to go and get locked up somewhere. That facility that we shut down, what I'm gonna do with that is turn that into kind of a day treatment center. Again, if a judge feels that the kid needs to go to one of our facilities for treatment, for vocational ed, why can't he do that somewhere where he goes during the day and then goes home at night? Why does he need to sleep in one of our facilities in order to get those services? So we're going to put those services there. Um, and again, get, keep giving the judges and the courts more options and more alternatives and to lock less kids up. So I think that's the change, the biggest change that I've seen, um, you know, really throughout my career and a lot of that within the last year. Any other questions for Mr. Gonzalez? Sure. Sure. You know, my favorite thing to teach is theories. And, and the reason is because I think it's real important that we understand why kids end up where they are, why they end up in our system. And the important thing for that is because then that tells you what you need to do to help this kid. You know, what I want to make sure is that within our facilities that we're never locking kids up, that you're not sending a kid to the youth village so he can do time. And I don't want our staff to think that that's why we send a kid there. Um, we are very fortunate that we have the forensic team that we have that do the evaluations on our kids. And that helps you again in determining what were those risk factors that, that contributed to the kid getting in trouble and then how do we address those so that hopefully the kid doesn't do it again. Um, you know, and then to also learn what protective factors are so that when we identify those, we know how to use those to our advantage, again, to give the kid what he needs so that he or she doesn't go any deeper in our system or so that when they leave, they're, they're permanently out of our system. So I think that's the thing that's really important to understand. With that comes the psychology. 
uh, because if you can learn how kids are thinking, how parents are thinking, that really puts you at an advantage to, uh, to work with our kids. And I can real e very easily turn the question back to the person who asked because she's one of our star probation officers. I will tell you that, who's a graduate student here. Um, and would you agree that perhaps that's probably kind of what's really important to learn? Yeah, I mean, I was definitely kind of assuming that's where the answer was going to go. Yeah. Because I think we're actually more proactively moving really forceful. Um, we're starting to alter the community's perception of what we're doing by preventing ourselves in sweat. So I kind of think I'm using a system here and challenging them the way uh, Mr. Rivera said to mm -hmm. ask the right kind of question and figure out at a basic level um, where the commonalities are in the geographical areas and in the right. community. So how do we practice at a kind of more mass level in order to prevent it and divert kids from the system and keep them at home while better in the community? Absolutely, and that's what we want to do. You know, because I truly believe that, you know, the kids that we work with, God, they have a lot of potential. But I think, uh, unfortunately, we do label them. They are labeled in so many ways. Um, you know, when I mentioned that, uh, you know, that I wasn't on the college track, I think in high school, if people, if you would have asked people in my school, would I be standing up here and doing this now? No, I would have been one of those kids that they, or they would have considered me to be one of those kids that, that I work with today. One of the funny things that, uh, or stories that I share with people is that when I worked at pre-trial and would interview people, and I mentioned that I worked midnights. Remember, I was 19 years old doing this. So, you know, I, I would go have my fun, but I'd have to leave at a certain time so I could be at, be in jail at midnight to interview people. And there were more than a few times to where as I'm calling people up to the window to interview them, it would be the same friends that I was with earlier that day. Um, you know, and I couldn't, I can't help but stop and think that if I didn't do that, where would I be today? Um, you know, what would have happened, but I was probably the same kid that we work with. And, and, and I think, again, it's just giving people that, and giving these kids that opportunity, number one, to be kids, because so many times we don't give them the opportunity to do that. My favorite population to work with was gang kids. And those are the ones that, because of their title, because of their role, they don't get to be kids. When people ask me, how do you work with your gang kids? Like a kid. Let them be that kid. Give them that opportunity to be that kid. Um, so again, those theories are real important. Learn what evidence-based programs and practices are, uh, why those are important. Uh, learn how important it is to engage the community, um, to learn what a community actually is and how do you do that. Um, so that would be my answer there. All right, then, thank you very much. So I, I hope you all uh, got a good taste for the, the variety of, of, of positions and, and careers that you could get within the, within the field of criminal justice. Just with the three gentlemen that we've had here, there's just a plethora of different uh, uh, career opportunities. So thank you all for coming. Please remember to fill out your um, evaluation. If you don't have one, I have them here. And there's pizza. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen.